Well, again, good morning, everyone. And uh, we're starting into a series this morning. It's going to be a couple of weeks, a series that we're titling Prayer First. What we want to do is we want to uh, think together about how we respond to God as, uh, as we move through life. And we want to think about this discipline of prayer as being a gift, a tool that God has given to us. This morning, we're going to look at a story that's recorded for us in the Older Testament, where we're going to see a biblical character who took seriously this charge or this challenge to pray first. Many years ago, my good friend Tom Nebel, who, by the way, is uh, here today, we were... Uh, we were high school friends in Sturgeon Bay. He took his family to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. At the time, his son Matthew was 10 years old. And they were listening to a presentation that was being made by an astronaut who was talking generally about space exploration and specifically about the astounding achievement of uh, a man having walked on the moon. And this astronaut was encouraging, particularly the young people who were there, to, be a, to, to dream big, to think of uh, what they might possibly be able to accomplish. And young Matthew, about 10 years old at the time, turned to his dad and with a real serious face said, Dad, I'm going to be the first man to land on the sun. <laughs> And Tom thought for a moment and then said, okay, Matthew, but do it at night, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Without question, while mankind has been entrusted by God with remarkable ability and with remarkable opportunities to achieve and accomplish uh, remarkable things, there are still some things that are beyond us, right? Right? like landing on the sun. We get that, right? There are still some things that are beyond our ability. We do have some finite ability boundaries. We get that, right? God, however, is infinite. He doesn't have ability boundaries. The story of the Bible tells us that all things are possible with God. Nothing is too difficult for him. It's a recurring theme throughout the biblical story. Over and over again, God demonstrates his authority over all of life. There's no challenge that overwhelms him. There's no opposition that overcomes him. All things are possible with God. Nothing is too difficult for him. Here's the question this morning. Do you personally believe that? Do you personally believe that? It's a question that was faced by a, a king in Judah 2,800 years ago. The king's name was Jehoshaphat. <laughs> I know, what were his parents thinking <laughs> when they named him? I mean, his name sounds like uh, an ingredient that you'd read on the carton of yogurt, you know? <laughs> Just one gram of Jehoshaphat. <laughs> Seriously, he was the fourth king in Judah. And the biblical historian tells us this is kind of the, the summary over his life. Jehoshaphat sought the Lord with all his heart. It's a pretty remarkable epitaph. The summary over his life. He sought the Lord with all his heart. It's not that Jehoshaphat was perfect. In fact, in uh, the book of 2 Chronicles, when we have four chapters of biography on Jehoshaphat, we see a couple of occasions where he was engaged in really curious compromise that was costly. In one case, it almost cost him his life. Nevertheless, the bulk of his life decisively pointed toward God. His father was a king named Asa. When Asa died, Jehoshaphat succeeded him as king. He was 35 years old when he became king over Judah. 
we're told that he ruled in that nation for 25 years. Perhaps the zenith moment in his life was the excellent leadership that he offered during a time of significant crisis in Judah. By the way, isn't that the test of real leadership? Really? Isn't that the test of real leadership? Leaders who lead well excel in the midst of adversity. So when C-SPAN did a poll in 2017 on the greatest presidents in the United States, it came back, Lincoln, Washington, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. One was leading during the Civil War, one was leading during the Revolutionary War, and one was leading during World War II. Jehoshaphat was one of those leaders who excelled in the midst of adversity. Though he came to power over 2,800 years removed from us, the issue he had to wrestle through in his crisis is similar to an issue that you and I are confronted with when we face our own life challenges. And here's the question. What's your first move when facing a life crisis? What's your first move when facing a life crisis? Jehoshaphat was confronted with a major threat in 2 Chronicles 20. If you have a Bible with you, you could turn to 2 Chronicles 20 right now. If you have a Bible app on your phone, you could go there right now. Just turn the ringer down if you would. Uh, this passage is also going to be on the screen. It's also on the, uh, the back of the bulletin program, or at least the first six verses of this passage. We'll be reading beyond those six verses. But the real crisis that Jehoshaphat was facing is presented to us in the first two verses. And this is what we read. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Moonites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. And though uh, we're 2,800 years disconnected from um, uh, this historical circumstance, this is what I can tell you, this was a serious and a really formidable threat. Jehoshaphat's about 55 years old now in this passage. He's been in office for about 20 years. He's been around the block long enough to know that the nations around Judah have no regard for the Hebrew people. Jehoshaphat also knows that coalitions of nations pose an unconventional threat to Judah. It wasn't like one nation was coming against them. This was a coalition. And he hears that this coalition is already mobilized and they're pressing toward Jerusalem. We're told in these two verses that uh, this coalition involved the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Moonites. They were all a part of a, uh, a, a larger uh, coalition called Edom. Edom was a, uh, a coalition of peoples that were in opposition to God. They were antagonistic to him. They were antagonistic to his people. And Gedi was about uh, 25 miles as the crow flies from Jerusalem. It's about 35 miles by foot. Enemies mobilized and advancing, and here's the key. They're probably two days away. They're two days away. Jehoshaphat understood the ominous severity of the situation. The beginning of verse 3 tells us that he was afraid. Now, given his uh, understandable fear, we might expect that he'd default into a very defensive posture. And he'd scurry around uh, trying to gather his security advisors. The enemy's two days away. So 
So what's he going to do? And while we're following the narrative, again, let's step out of the narrative for a moment because, friends, this isn't just a history lesson this morning. God is here to speak to us where we are in our situations right now. So the question that we want to ask again that we asked a little bit earlier is this. What's our first move when faced with a crisis? I fully expect that there are people who walked into this room today in a group this size, and you are facing some stiff challenges right now. There may be people here today who are having difficulty making ends meet. There are people facing health challenges and and health concerns. You may have a broken heart about a relationship that's gone south. I expect that there are people who came in today who are facing some significant challenges. And so we ask this question, friends, what's our first move when faced with the crisis? Most of us here at one time or another have known what it is to be faced with a challenge that wakes you up in the night. And when it does, you find yourself just staring at the ceiling, not knowing what to do. Wisdom says you can't ignore it, but wisdom also says you can't fix it on your own. So what's your first move? when facing a formidable challenge. In verses 3 to 4 of 2 Chronicles 20, we see Jehoshaphat choosing to pray first. Let me hit the pause button. This isn't just stained glass talk. This is real life. This is real life. This is what we read in verses 3 and 4 of 2 Chronicles 20. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled. Can you, can you picture this? It's a whole nation. Enemies, two days away. Probably, probably took them a day to get to Jerusalem to gather there. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. In his alarm, this king, Jehoshaphat, set his face to seek the Lord. And I just need to tell you that while this story instructs me, it also sobers me. And perhaps some of you will uh, identify with this also. When I'm brutally honest, I recognize that my first impulse frequently in the face of challenge is to rely on my own ingenuity and my own ability. It's not that I don't think of prayer at all. It's just that my instinct in crisis tends toward prayer as a last resort. Anybody hear that? You know, well, I'll do what I can do and then I'll pray. Jehoshaphat turned that all around, didn't he? He turned it around. His posture was... I'll pray, and then I'll do what God enables me to do. Very different. A very different posture. In his crisis, Jehoshaphat looked to God first. And friends, I just find this very instructive and very humbling, very sobering. Rather than gathering his cabinet and consulting with his joint chiefs of staff, he first looks to God. And he calls the entire nation to join him in this posture of looking to God. Remember, the enemy is only two days away. And we're further told that Jehoshaphat calls the entire nation to a fast. Now that's, a fast is not praying quickly. A fast is a discipline that's referenced a number of times in the scriptures 
where we abstain from something, um, very often it's food for a period of time, so that, so that we can focus our attention on God and on who He is. We submit all our desires to this one priority desire for God Himself because there is this recognition we need Him. And personally, going without food for a time has in my life helped me focus on the one who not only provides food for the body, but also relationship for my soul. In fact, uh, this past Friday, I had a day that I had set aside to fast and pray. Ten days ago, my, uh, my nephew's wife, we were just in a family reunion two weeks ago. My nephew's wife discovered ten days ago that uh, she has Hodgkin's lymphoma. She has uh, a child who's two and a half and a child that's three months old. And uh, they are leaning into now a plan for how is this going to get attacked. But as a family, as a larger extended family, my youngest daughter, Stacy, sent an email to everybody and said, uh, out of our love for Amy and Matthew and those two little girls, we are going to pray as a family this morning. And she set up a uh, like a 36-hour um, intensive prayer sign-up sheet where we could each sign up for an hour. And then she also said, over the next 40 days, would you pick a day or days in which you will choose to fast and pray during that day? And that was true for me this past Friday. And in fasting that day and whenever I have engaged in that discipline, what I have come to recognize is that when I feel pangs of hunger, and I do, I'm reminded to focus attention on God and interact with Him. Because He can do more in a moment than I could do in days and days of my best efforts. Jehoshaphat was really clear about his first move. He called the nation to fast and pray. When people from all over the land convened together in Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat himself, himself stood up and he led that vast throng in prayer. I mean, I'm kind of picturing, you know, the mall in Washington, D.C., you know, and the Lincoln Memorial there. And Jehoshaphat and all of Judah's counterparts to that standing and looking out over this vast throng of people. And he doesn't speak to the crowd. He speaks to God on behalf of the crowd. And together the whole nation is before God. And this is the prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed, which is such an instructive prayer, beginning at verse 5. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. By the way, I think this is just such a great way to start in prayer. When we start in prayer, let's go to God first. Look at Him, at who He is. Before we begin our litany of requests, get before God and remind yourself who he is, and honor him for who he is. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house and cry out to you in our affliction 
and you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy, behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. I just, this is verse 12. I love this verse so much. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we're powerless against this great horde that's coming against us. And here's the line that I just pray gets pressed into all of us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Isn't that a beautiful line? We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I love that line. It reminds me of a, uh, a principle that I learned uh, 40 years ago when I was in college, um, you know, back in the Paleozoic era. Um, <laughs> It was a, a prayer principle that had been popularized by Crew, Campus Crusade for Christ. It's called the Gaze Glance Principle. And this is the way the Gaze Glance Principle works. That what God is calling us to do is to gaze on Him and to glance on our need. But frequently what happens with us, we just turn it around, right? We gaze on our need, whatever it might be, and we're preoccupied with it. We glance at God. It's as though we give a nod to him, but we are fixated with whatever the challenge is that we're facing. And I believe what God is inviting us to do today with whatever the challenge or crisis is that you might be facing that's, that's percolating in your life, you look hard at Him. You gaze at Him. It's not that you ignore your need. It's not that you deny your need. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. Okay? It's not that you ignore or deny your need. You are aware of it. You're honest about it. You lament it. But you bring it to God. Your gaze is on Him. And on His ability to do what only He can do in this situation. And here's what begins to happen. As you gaze on God, He gives you His perspective on your challenge and on your need. What the Bible calls us to do is to flip around our instinct. When facing a crushing challenge, pray first. And then there is a second principle that I want us to notice in this passage. And we might state it this way. After you pray, obey. After you pray, obey. You can almost hear a pin drop when you get to verse 13. All the men of Judah with their wives and with their children and little ones, they're all there before the Lord. Jehoshaphat's prayed. And I imagine it was as quiet in there as it is in here right now. Only the sound of the breeze and a few whimpers from babies being held by their parents. And into that quietness, the Spirit of God comes on a prophet named Jehaziel. Speaking for God, Jehaziel says, in verse 15, he said, Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Judah, of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours. But God's. It's a significant line, isn't it? Dropping down to verse 17. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. God had spoken. In response to prayer, God had spoken. And he was promising victory. When God says that the battle is not ours, but his, he doesn't mean by that that we become passive. Interestingly, God tells the people in verse 17, now think about this, you will not have to fight this battle and a little later in that very same verse, go out to face them tomorrow. 
Now, that almost sounds like a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. It's a paradox. It's a biblical paradox. There's an important principle here, and this is how I'd state it. After you pray, obey. After you pray, when God begins to move, you join him where he's working. As God moves in answer to prayer, he may choose to deploy us as a part of his answer. He'll be the decisive factor as we face into daunting challenges. He'll win the victory. And he'll see us through. And he calls us to join him in the working out of that victory. And though Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah had been assured of victory, they would have been disobedient if they'd refused to go out and face the enemy that was coming their way. They weren't passive, they were active as partners with God in his victory. The biblical historian tells us that the people went out and praised the Lord. Now watch this. And from their positions, they witnessed the unexplainable victory that God had secured for them. The story ends in verse 30. It simply says, And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. This is Jehoshaphat's legacy. Pray first, and after you pray, obey. So, friends, this morning when we ask this question, what's your first move when facing a crisis or daunting challenge? Here's what God's Spirit prompted in Jehoshaphat and what I believe, friends, He wants to say to us today, to those of us with ears to hear in this place. When facing a challenge that threatens to crush you, engage the one who's greater than your challenge. And I'm not bashful about saying, I want that truth to get pressed deeper into me, friends. I want it to get pressed deeper into you. When facing a challenge that threatens to crush you, engage the one who's greater than your challenge. Be sure of this. Whatever, whatever the adversity you may be facing today, God wants to work through that very pressure to mercifully drive you to Him. The Apostle Paul put it this way in, 1 Corinthians, or in 2 Corinthians 1.9. He said, Indeed, we felt in our hearts the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but God. So I pray the truth of this story that played out in the stage of history would really get pressed into us. It would go deeper. Again, when facing a challenge that threatens to crush you, engage the one who's greater than your challenge. I think it's possible that there are people in a room this size who may have come in today and you are right on the verge of waving the white flag and just saying, I, I give up. I'm overwhelmed. I give up. And losing heart. And what I want to say to today, again, all things are possible with God. Nothing's too difficult for Him. He always has at least one more move. About a year and a half ago at the No Regrets Conference at uh, Elmbrook Church in Waukesha, there was a speaker there named Albert Tate. Albert's the pastor at uh, Fellowship Monrovia, which is a, uh, a growing multi-ethnic church in Monrovia, California. Because my oldest daughter and son-in-law live in Pasadena, I've been to Fellowship Monrovia a number of times. I love Albert Tate, and I was delighted when I heard he was going to be at this men's conference in Milwaukee. Albert closed his message with a story that I want to close with this morning. And one day there were two men who went into an art museum. 
And as they went into this museum, uh, the first guy who walked in was captivated by a painting that he saw just inside the front door. His friend decided to explore other parts of the art gallery, but they'd gotten there later in the day. And so uh, the other friend was kind of in a hurry, but this one friend was captivated by this painting. It was a, it was a painting of a chess game. And at the bottom, there was this title under the painting that said, Checkmate. Which, for those of you who are familiar with chess, know means the game is over. But he was studying this painting. He was studying and evaluating and studying and evaluating. And something wasn't right about this painting. His friend, looking at other paintings, had returned and he said, hey, look, it's about time for the art gallery to close. We need to, we need to leave now. We need to go. And he said, no, I'll be with you just a second. There's just something about this painting. He said, what? His friend, just a painting of a chess game. He said, no, no, there's something that's just not right about this. And he studied and evaluated and studied and evaluated. And then he, sa- he turned to his friend and he said, this painting is wrong. <laughs> How could a painting be wrong? It's just a picture of a chess game. He said, yeah, maybe. He said, look at the bottom. The title says checkmate, which means the game is over. But if you look closely, the king has at least one more move in this painting. The game can't be over. The king has at least one more move. Friends, I'm here today to tell us we have a king who's on the throne. And he is reigning. And he has at least one more move. In your challenge, in your crisis, whatever it might be, he has at least one more move. Can we say it together? One more move. The king, our king, the reigning Lord Jesus, is here to meet with us when we come to him. When we come to God the Father, through God the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit, there is at least one more move. So this morning, for myself and for you, could we resolve together that we'll go to Him first? Father in heaven, Lord, right now, I want to pray for friends who kept a sacred appointment with you and they came into this place today. And life has been really heavy for them and really, really challenging. And yet they're here. God, I ask your spirit would be speaking to them right now. Your spirit would be encouraging them right where they're at. God, I pray that they would honestly lament whatever it is that is agonizing for them. God, I pray that their lament would lead them right to you. God, I pray you do some amazing and even unexplainable thing in this fellowship and through this fellowship in coming weeks in Jesus' name.